What's up, punks? It's Shinobi, and we are bringing you Block Digest number 209 at block height 615,393 on Friday, January 31st, 2020. So is anybody sick yet? You guys coughing? Feeling feeling, feeling weird? Got a fever? Huh? I, I definitely feel sick uh, after watching BBC going between, oh my god, we're all gonna die everyone by mass right now the plane the plane is landing and then yeah let's go party brexit it's like very interesting contrast did you know that taking basic health precautions is racist yes it is well (laughs) i mean no but there has been some incidents of people overreacting, which is something that is common and the media should feel responsible for because they are they are obviously taking advantage of the fact that, you know, this could potentially be a problem, like a really, really bad problem. But if you do common sense stuff, then you're fine. But most people just hear China, China, stay away from Chinese people or are infected and they react in stupid ways i just got some chinese food yesterday it was yummy oh man so do we just skip the the public health bulletin today Did I, I get my doctor hat out for no reason well i hope i hope everyone enjoyed our commercials <laughs> actually i did not have a chance to splice those into the last one but oh my I, god i am going you to denied. with this one you going denied to this the one. audience you denied the audience the parrot no it won't be funny anymore because now it's actually <laughs> so those commercials are coming Demi. you've denied our audience their comic relief all right well i guess if i've done that should we should we give them some awesome fucking news i mean before that i just like to know that you guys ruined my intro completely because i wanted to say that the number we are all looking at is over nine thousand. And (laughs) unfortunately, it's not the price. It's the price, too. But it's the number of total confirmed cases, which is 9,776. And total deaths are up from 190-ish to 200. Oh, my God. So, yeah. We are awful. Anyway. Uh, is it bad that I'm that thinking black, about a new version of, of the over 9,000 shirt in my head right now? No, Shinobi, stop. <laughs> it's not funny. Let's, let's stop it. Okay, okay, okay. Bitcoin show, Bitcoin news, Bitcoin show, Bitcoin news. The, the, one, right. thing, the one thing that I think we should point out, though, because everyone's saying like, oh, 60,000 Americans die from the flu every year. And while that's true, the... The part that they're leaving out is the, you know, the kill rate versus the infection rate. So, like, if 100 million people get infected, but, like, less than 1% of them die, that's a lot different than, you know, 10,000 people getting infected and, you know, 5%. Like, that's a higher death rate, and that's important. (laughs) Oh, but that's that's applying logic, Janine. I mean, yeah, these numbers cannot really be very conclusive yet because you could say there are 10,000 cases and 200 deaths and you could say, well, that's not that bad. Then you could say there are 200 deaths and 200 total recovered and then you could say, well, that's pretty bad. And then you could realize that many of the cases in china they don't even get into the hospital only the worst cases get into the hospital and no one died abroad so anyway (laughs) let's do the show 
All right. So awesome fucking news. Um, Jack Mollers has reappeared from a little quiet period to drop uh, LN Strike, an iteration building on his Olympus platform uh, that he released a little bit uh, earlier last year. And this is just fucking cool as shit. So the, you know, short recap with Olympus, the, the idea was to just have something you could hook a debit card up to in the app to just instantly open a lightning channel um, with Bitcoin you just bought to be able to onboard people onto the lightning network for, for retail use as quickly as possible. And, you know, it's, if you read through the, the post he wrote up, he, he actually ran into a lot of issues with that. And the way he put it was he set out to onboard users into the lightning network as simply and frictionlessly as possible. And when he really looked at Olympus after it was built out, in, in his words, he he solved the problem of onboarding the Bitcoin onto the lightning network, but left the user behind. And like, you know what, like one of the biggest issues um, he saw come up a lot was people would would buy their Bitcoin and it would open up the channel. And then within five minutes, the the prices swung so much that they're either not spending it um, because oh the price went up. Let's see how much more it goes up, or they're they're not spending it because it's gone down and it's it's either not enough for their purchase or that they don't want to spend it at a loss now. And you know even the the huge strides that Olympus made, like there were still these problems. And so he put together the the whole design for Strike. Uh, on the idea of, you know, this this isn't about getting your Bitcoin into your channel on the network smoothly. It's about getting a user who's not familiar with any of this into the Lightning Network. And so pretty much the, the gist of Strike is you just hook up your, your debit card like you, you did with Olympus. But instead of the whole mechanism be to, to set up your own channel with that Bitcoin, um, you're, you're pretty much just using... Um, Jack's node and liquidity in the background in his channels to instantly pay him through your debit card and then his node fulfills your lightning payment. Or if you're trying to receive money, his node receives that payment and then credits your debit card and bank with it. So it's it's literally just that uh, account system where you can hook your bank into the Lightning Network. Like the, the way he put this is your bank account can now speak Bitcoin. With, with this app and service, you can receive Bitcoin and just poof, it just pops into your bank account. Or you can buy something with Bitcoin and just poof, the, the money debited out of your account and it just gets paid over Lightning Network. And... I'm sure that, you know, a lot of people are looking at that and thinking, oh, KYC, yada, yada, yada. But, you know, this isn't for people who have issues with these types of things. This is for your average normal person. And this is the perfect type of tool for this. And as far as uh, the the KYC custodial, it's not custodial. Like this is effectively, you know, with the caveat, obviously the legacy system can reverse or charge things back. Um, Atomic between your bank account being debited or credited and money moving on the lightning network through Jack's node with this. And so like, I I am really fucking psyched about this. And honestly, (laughs) this, this kind of has me entertaining the idea, like, what if we, what if me and Mister Hoddle were dickheads at, at, with the, the shirt store, or shirt store, and just stopped taking like card payments directly? Like, it's like, oh, you you want to to pay with your card? We'll go use this app instead. But yeah, I think this is going to be very interesting when, when this actually hits, uh, you know, public release in the next couple months. No ring, no evil banks are taking over. No, this is cool. No, nothing. No, this is really cool um, because I didn't know this is exactly what he was working on, but I kind of got hints several months ago, and it's really awesome to see that this is what it came to because, like, yeah, it's it's still using a bank account, but it's it's still super useful 
for um, at least the the main use case I see is for people who want to get paid in Bitcoin, but maybe their employer isn't doesn't have Bitcoin or isn't willing to buy Bitcoin in order to pay them in Bitcoin or receive Bitcoin through the business. So I I see that as a great use case for people who who haven't had that option yet. And it's it's just the the, the use for a, a Bitcoiner like me. If if I'm going to spend Bitcoin on something, like I I immediately think uh, the taxes that's irritating. Like what's the gains? Like this is I wouldn't even have to think about this or 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 look at my current holding. I just hook my my debit card up to it and then zap. I just pay with Lightning whenever I want. I don't have to think about taxes or gains. Like I am instantly acquiring this and then instantly sending it. That there are no taxes. I think you mean strike, not zap. <laughs> uh oh, I had a whoopsies with my brain word. Yeah, this is. I think this is going to be really interesting in terms of retail adoption in the developed world. Yeah, and it's also like it's good to see that he made the smart decision to pivot. You know, the focus of the project instead of just keeping on going with something that he didn't think would work in the long term because uh, that's a problem that a lot of companies have uh wink wink that uh Mm -hmm. their business model's not working anymore but they try to keep it alive as long as possible um but yeah it's just waste of time so good that he made that decision early on Mm -hmm. It's, it's just another reason i'm positive he's gonna fucking build some amazing shit in this space like it's it's not it's like you build it, you see if it works or not, and then you you iterate. Like he he's not wasting his time with just a, oh no 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 if I just do this or that. So what's up, Nopara? I uh, are you going to integrate this into Wasabi? Is, is this the Lightning support we've all been waiting for? It's funny that you just <laughs> said that because anyway, so yeah, I start from the beginning. So. You might have known that I'm going to be in a video game and this game is going to is coming from Zebedee and the name of it is Raiki and it's some some Mortal Kombat like like game Uh, and I'm going to be one of the character and the other and another character will be Nicola Dorier and we are going to have a match sing in the advancing Bitcoin conference. So we are, we are going to go against each other. Now there is something else about this game is that you can support on the Lightning network uh, with the Lightning with Lightning transactions. So you, you send some small amount of money and then I don't know how it works, but this is how I imagine then my my health goes up or something like that. So I can kick Nicolas's ass. Now, uh, I was thinking, hmm, maybe I should integrate Lightning to Wasabi. And how would I do that? What if I only integrate it with, if only integrate it for full node users? What should I have to do that? Okay, let's just write an API for C Lightning. And then I was trying to, I was looking at C Lightning, uh, trying to to integrate it or or didn't even start it yet because I've seen something, something very, very bad about C Lightning. And I quote, C Lightning works on Linux and Mac OS. Fuck, really? Seriously? <laughs> there's, a, there's something missing on that list. What is it? What? Oh, the malware you use on your computer. Yeah, so I'm not <laughs> not spiking sea lightning into Wasabi like ever because of this. Well, I guess that's a no lightning integration. Yeah. Okay, that's that was a short story about this experience this said experience well i want to go back to to the idea really quick of of the game and then that integration and stuff before we we jump ahead of the next one because you you said that people can 
pay over lightning to refill your health bar. So whoever wins or loses the match is pretty much whoever can get random Twitter trolls to spam the most money over lightning. Yes, that was the idea behind the integration too. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, I oh man. I'm not gonna lie, I can see that not really going too well with a fighting game like that, but I think that would get really interesting with like a strategy game like StarCraft. Mm-hmm. I don't I don't know actually. I mean there there is like one demo of the game, so online and I just I'm just guessing here. Maybe they found out something more more reasonable. Maybe not. I don't know. It'll be funny, that's for sure. <laughs> maybe, maybe maybe if you if you refill your health, then the money goes to your opponent, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Um, anyway. Priceless. But yeah. I guess let's just hop into the next one. Um, this one, it's not really going to be that long. There's not really that much here. Um, so Kraken uh, today just dropped a blog post going over a Trezor, uh, Trezor 1 and a Trezor Model T uh, exploit that could extract the seed from the hardware. And I mean, really, the TLDR is that this is the exact same thing that they did with the, the Keep Key uh, a month or so ago. Like that this is the unfixable hardware issue with the STM32 MCUs. And I mean, like, you know, I, I, like I, I really want at this point. It's like, and as somebody who who loves laughing with glee, seeing things get busted in this space, um, I, I really have to go. Like, what the fuck are you doing here, Kraken? Like, we've known about this vulnerability for more than a year. We've known the specifics of it since they they did the write up with the the keep key, which is the the same hardware uh, a month or so ago. Why the hell is this being released now and a big PR push? It's the exact same thing that they did with the keep key. Like th th this should have just been a, l a little note or a little section in, in that last write up that all, all of the, this attack is, is possible with the, the treasure, like this class of exploit affects anything with this chip. And I really have to question the motives of a custodial exchange that is kind of just stretching the, the the PR mileage out of something that, that we've known about for the last year now. Like, why are they doing this? Like, the, the, this to me at this point doesn't look like purely just a company researching things because people should know this stuff. I mean, this is getting to the point where it looks like a custodial exchange is, is just trying to maximize, oh, don't trust hardware wallets. So, like what the fuck maybe they just stumbled upon it but i mean th th that's bullshit no par like we we know we've known this is possible for over a year like that this was uh where, where was it black hat i think that this was first mentioned kraken themselves demonstrated this on a different device that uses the same chip already like what what what's the fucking point here like this isn't uh oh something people are unaware of you guys should should know about this no th this is them just repeating the exact same thing they repeated last month like th this is not this does not look like security research to me this looks like pr yeah that that was my point that maybe someone just somehow stumbled upon it and then oh this works nice let's write something about it but that's the point. They did. They wrote something about it last month when they published this this attack on the keep key. Like it's the same attack, the same hardware, the same vulnerability. It's just a different company selling it. Like there, you're this this doesn't have value as a security disclosure at this point. We already knew this. Like this is just like oh, um, it's next month. It's time to to make people uncertain about hardware wallets again. Yeah, but that's exactly my point, what you're saying. I'm not arguing against it. Um, I'm saying that someone just stumbled upon it. He wasn't actually researching the topic, just somehow get, get to know about it and thought, oh, it will be a nice write-up. Let's get some PR, you know? 
yeah, but like fuck that, dude. Like that that's like that's not how you should be handling real security issues like this. It's it's not like we just keep going, oh this this thing, this thing, this thing over and over and over. You you disclose it, you help it get patched, and then it, it is what it is. Everybody knows it. Like, you know what I mean? I like fuck. I hate Trezor. I think that wallet's a steaming pile of shit and half the people at that company are incompetent as hell. But like I'm not I'm not running around screaming that from the rooftops every day or trying to keep that the the topic of discussion. Like I've said my piece. I'll say it again if it comes up or something happens that we should talk about. But like this, you know, it like I, I don't like this. This is a custodial business that is portraying their their research like this in, in a way that's like they're they're spreading fucking uncertainty over this shit. The the same way that that that's happening in, in this space with privacy tools. Like I don't like this. I I do not like this direction of fucking companies in this space spending their time and resources just shitting on all their competitors disingenuously whether it's outright lying whether it's misframing things to be misleading just to to try and make themselves look like the good service because the end result of this shit is you just add to the confusion that new people have to deal with coming in here Mm -hmm. yeah (laughs) it's like i i can only reiterate i i agree with that it just it just i was speculating on how this something like this could happen if they, this thing has been disclosed already, and they were not aware of it, so that means they, they were, did not do a good research at all. I mean, like Janine, you, you got anything to say on this one? Um, I mean, not really. I'm just, I'm just kind of confused why. And I mean, what I see is like a vulnerability that's all already been disclosed and talked about is being brought up again like it's a new thing it just doesn't make sense to me and like did they say they spent they spent several hundred dollars on it like i don't i don't i just don't see why it's necessary yeah that's my point it's like this isn't doing anything useful at this point like it's just spreading uncertainty because like if i don't know it i just i don't see why they're doing it because people are going to look at it and think it's a new one but it's an old one and so they're going to they're going to overestimate you know how many risks there actually are when it's just i don't know this just doesn't make sense to me but exchanges are a bit weird and they have a lot of money and they have money to waste i guess mm-hmm. well i guess i don't know uh kraken stop being so fucking shady other than that though uh you want to take us into the next two things gene yeah, so there's, um, I mean, they're not really stories. They're just kind of updates about uh, Castle Hoddle, and I'll combine them into one because they're kind of related. Um, the first is that Jeremy Welsh, who's the co-founder and CEO of Casa, um, announced that he will be stepping down as CEO and moving into an advisor position uh, for an unspecified amount of time. I don't know if it's permanent or he's just doing this temporarily, but he said that he has to deal with a family health issue. So he doesn't, he doesn't have the time or focus to, um, be CEO at the moment. And he tweeted about how proud he was of what CASA has accomplished, um, this, uh, so far. And in the 2019 that he listed all of the projects and features that they've built out this year, um, and then passed on his uh, responsibility to um, Nick Newman, who was their head of product. And also, um, I think Jamison Lopp will still be the CTO, but they've both been added to the board of directors. Um, so that's pretty cool. Uh, and then in the second blog post, which is written by Nick, the new CEO, um, they will be... Uh, it basically he writes about what they'll be focusing on for 2020 and one of the big changes um, is that they uh, say they will not be developing the hardware devices anymore Um, he writes we will be open sourcing the CASA nodes so that anyone can build it on their own hardware and we won't be building new nodes for now 
The CASA node was a massive step forward in usability for Bitcoin and Lightning nodes. We created the first plug and play hardware node that allowed people to run Bitcoin and Lightning as it was meant to be with your own node. The node 2 is now shipping to everyone who purchased one and we're excited to get in your hands. While we sold out our first batch of CASA node 2s, uh, given the laser focus on Keymaster, we've decided to stop selling CASA node 2 in the near term. As part of this change, we'll work to fully open source node software and its build scripts and images so anyone can build the cast node on their own hardware we'll have more details uh, on this coming um so yeah they're basically just going to open source it which um i mean they should have they should probably were planning to do eventually at least they should have been planning to uh but yeah so keymaster is basically going to their, be their main focus and keymaster is their multi-sig application that um, they want to build out with more inheritance features, hardware wallet integrations. Uh, they specifically mentioned cold card and expanding their membership program and improving usability in general for these types of things. So, yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, I think this honestly was probably just like we did that market it is probably saturated as all hell right now. Yeah. And sales are probably slowing down. So it's like, you know, the, their main business is the, the custody and the fees for that. So it's probably just like a sales are slowing down. Like we'd have to cut margins to compete. So like to just spin it off and let people set it up themselves and concentrate on the actual like custody management tools. And you know, honestly, as long as they like, and I, I really do think that, that'll probably be a net benefit in the end if they actually put the resources in to deal with all the, the little fringe issues that most installers have so that it's simple to use but i i think that would wind up being a net positive yeah i'm not i don't i haven't looked i have no idea how big they've gotten but it makes sense if you're a relatively small company it's hard to do it's hard to be a company that makes a product and also a company that offers like like custody and inherit inheritance advice. I mean, they can go together, but um, maybe they're they're just picking which one they want to focus on because they they're not that big yet to be so you know diversified. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it's all good. I mean, I, I'm not going to be mad that uh, you know they open source everything and make it free as opposed to charge money for it. I, I like having more options to get people running nodes that don't cost money. <laughs> yeah. Alrighty. So, okay. Uh, next up, uh, this is going to be a little bit of a interesting conversation. So we've had uh, another exchange freeze somebody's account. And go, why are you using mixing tools while using Wasabi? Um, a Ronald McHoddled, <laughs> um, who is using Paxos, I believe. Um, and it's an, an interesting thing here I kind of want to point out is, you know, that there's a, a couple different possibilities of what's going on here. Uh, the first and the simplest is that some service is flagging anything going through Wasabi because of the, the plus token funds being mixed and the coordinator address being reused. Uh, Wasabi just merged uh, code to actually remove the, the coordinator address reuse and shift to a new address every time. So if that is pretty much all that's happening, uh, then this should resolve the issue. But if, if this is not just kind of a, a false flag right there and a lazy and competent service isn't correcting that because we have to pretend like we're, we're actually doing something here. Um, and it's actually an increasing scrutinization of using privacy tools uh, as, as a fallout of the, the FATF travel rule slowly starting to ripple out and different jurisdictions decide how to handle that and move towards enforcing things, then that changing the, the coordinator address is, isn't going to do anything. Um, they're going to tweak a few things and find a different fingerprint and this will continue happening. And so 
like what I really want to kind of point out here is like the, the core issue here is, is this just one company in one jurisdiction that's just this is a jurisdictional issue that this is not some big new trend that's starting to pop up everywhere um then realistically it's it's a problem in that jurisdiction so we're we're going to find out when this change rolls out and everything's updated and the wasabi coordinator stop reuses or stops reusing addresses but if this isn't what's going on then it's just the simple fact of the matter if you use privacy tools, um, you can't interact with custodial businesses with those UTXOs. And that's just the reality. So ultimately, we're, we're just going to have to wait and see after the update is actually pushed to the Wasabi coordinator um, and just see how that plays out. So it's already pushed. <clears throat> so everyone, every researcher scripts has been broken by this but oh well there was a lot of misinformation on the internet and it took me more time to reply to them than to to actually code it but it's it's not solving anything because mm -hmm. you know my, my like me looking at this and putting all of this together one okay the, this issue has happened with paxful with bitfinex with Paxos and with Singapore Binance. Now, Singapore Binance is obviously based out of Singapore. Um, Paxos has an actual physical office and presence in Singapore. Um, Finex and Paxful definitely operate in Singapore, but Finex also um, intermingles their liquidity pools with Quining, I think is how you pronounce it. Um, a Japanese exchange, I think, that also has a physical presence in Singapore. And so if you really look at all of the, the businesses um, involved in this, three of them have pretty substantial presences in Singapore, like the kind where you are going to look at the, the cost benefit of just dealing with something the government wants you to do versus the cost to your business if, if you have to pull out of that country now. And, you know, it's, it's really, to me, looking like it's, it's much more likely this is just in this one jurisdiction, there is some service or something that is flagging these things for whatever reason. And that, that's really the scope of, of what's going on right now. And so it's, is this jurisdiction going to start scrutinizing all privacy tools? Is this a trend that, that's developing? Or is this just the plus token thing and the address reuse? But like either way, everything I see looking at this, it, it, it's very likely that this is just something happening in one jurisdiction, at least so far. So Bitfinex is really a completely different thing because uh, the guy who got asked about stuff was actually not even using Wasabi, but Electrum. Um, and this happened way before the plus token thing. It happened a long time ago. Mm -hmm. And the thing was that it's it's obvious what happened there. It actually they they asked him about the coordinator address if he um, if he possesses that because their blockchain analysis did not know that that's the coordinator address. But it was when Wasabi was just starting out, you know. So this case was flagged because of the coordinator address, but it was like so early on that blockchain analysis didn't even incorporate that information to their software, which resulted in an Electrum user getting asked questions about on Bitfinex uh, half a year ago or over half a year ago, maybe a year ago, I don't know. So Bitfinex is, as far as I know, not doing this. Their blockchain analysis reported that that address and that was it. But I think if Bitfinex would be doing it too, just like uh, Binance Singapore and 
what's the what's the other Pox was, uh, I don't know, that is that even an exchange or mm-hmm. stable coin, something like that. Anyway, if Bitfinex would be doing that, then that would be the first thing that people would notice, right? Because Binance Singapore is tiny, Paxos is a stable coin scam, whatever that is. So Bitfinex is a, actually a big thing. So that would have be the thing that's being noticed, right? Mm-hmm. But it's just that's what I mean. Is like regardless of whether this is like slowly blacklisting the use of privacy tools, period, or it's just they're incompetent and keep flagging things incorrectly. It's uh, everything seems to be recently this one jurisdiction. We'll see. Mm-hmm. Let's let's move on to the crypto crime report 2020 chain analysis. And sorry guys, I couldn't link anything because I'm um, subscribed to the chain analysis mailing list or whatever they have. So they sent me this report. And I did not read it fully and I'm not even going to give you a summary. I'm just uh, I'm just going some some interesting drops of information there, what I took out of that. And one quote is that everything you need to know about darknet markets, exchanges, hacks, money laundering and more. Okay, sorry, I was reading as it would be an interesting quote, but this was actually a subtitle (laughs) that I noted to myself. So let's move on to the quote. While there are legitimate uses for mixers, the the data makes it clear that they are increasingly being utilized by hackers to obfuscate the path of stolen funds prior to cashing out. Exchanges can likely stop some of the cash outs and help law enforcement claw back stolen funds by halting suspicious transactions from mixers. Binance has already begun doing this and we think their model could be a useful example for other exchanges to follow. So they are citing Binance as the example to follow and that's like, that's really fucked up. I don't even want to go into why, but that's really fucked up. So they're they're pretty much just like literally advising their customers at this point, just flag anything that touches coin joins. No, uh, it's actually not in this 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 code, but uh, what the other advisor read that they they did is that if the if the amount is large, then consider coin joins as suspicious information. So that's their that's their official advisory there. What is a large amount? Yes, yes. So another in. I mean, do you have anything to add to this? I mean, just that that does not make me feel confident about how privacy tools are going to interact with custodial businesses. No, I mean, like, for fuck's sake, Binance is the very worst example who who is doing that because they actually get hacked and data leaked out your personal information. And that's... That's like, okay, let, let's make Binance ask more information so more information can leak out or I don't know. Anyway, so another statistics from this report, because I don't, I don't like it because they don't have sources and everything is so proprietary. You basically have to just believe whatever is written in there. So that's why I don't really want to go through the whole thing by myself Uh, but anyway so if you search for in in the report wasabi it has four mentions if you search for coin joins it has 13 mentions if you search for mixer it has 29 mentions so anyway i think that was something interesting there Uh, Last year in 2019 crime report, Wasabi had zero mentions. Wonder what will be in 2021. Yeah. 
that's 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 about it. Yeah, I mean that does not fill me with confidence in the sense that I mean, like, come on, th- th- that's your solution to privacy tools that you can't handle. Just oh, just harass any any customer that uses this based on arbitrary nonsense. So actually, this this bring, this brings me to a point that you know when I was talking with the Monero guy and he's. You know, Monero guys are always coming with Bitcoin is not fungible and Wasabi is not fungible. And they, many of them, they don't actually define fungibility, but it's indistinguishability. And then in the same, same argument, when they are arguing that Wasabi is not fungible, they, or specific guy was arguing that Wasabi is not fungible. He also put into the Binance example. And it's so funny because Binance couldn't distinguish between Wasabi outputs. So Binance decided the Wasabi output will be flagged regardless of its source or if they have suspicion. And they couldn't distinguish. Indistinguishability is a synonym for fungibility. <laughs> so he basically contradicted himself in that very comment that he wrote to me. <laughs> so that that was interesting. Yeah, dude, they're blacklisting all Wasabi coins from a coin joint. Just use Monero, dude. They'll accept Monero deposits. <sighs> okay. Alrighty. So hold on one second. Window is lagging. Okay, so next up is uh, it's, I mean, it's kind of an interesting proposal from uh, ZMN SCP XJ, the infamous Lightning developer. Um, so why, he, why is he infamous? Because, well, uh, I don't know, everybody knows him, even though it's like impossible to remember what his name is. <laughs> okay. But, um, you know, he, he proposed um, this new technique called a, a pay swap. Uh, to try and confuse chain analytics. Uh, it's actually about a, a week ago or a little more. Uh, I just noticed it though. Um, it's it's kind of an interesting idea. It's not something I could see really being cost effective in the very long term. But as long as we have cheap block space available, I, I think it's a pretty interesting concept. Um, so it's pretty much a variation on a coin swap uh, where that, that would be where you atomically just swap utxos with somebody else um and the the trick is to do it in a way that doesn't leave a script on the blockchain that gives away that some atomic exchange is going on here and you know schnorr and taproot are going to be huge help with that but the idea is instead of just making a payment uh, and getting change back to yourself in one transaction, what you would actually do is coordinate with the person you're paying. And I pick a, a UTXO that's greater than the payment amount. And I send you that whole UTXO. I just make a transaction with one input and one output giving you that whole UTXO. And we bury a smart contract in it um, for the next part where you take one of your UTXOs completely disconnected from the one I'm giving you, and then you make a normal transaction with one input and two outputs where I get my change back from, from the other transaction and you get the, the change back um, from the payment you're making to me. And so you can kind of completely screw with the, the current understanding of analytics heuristics because now the payment you're making just looks like a a transfer to yourself. A chain analysis company is going to see one input and one output and think that a user is just moving coins to a different address they control. But you're making a payment and then you getting change back from that in a completely disconnected transaction throws shit off because that looks like a payment, but it's not the payment. It's just you getting your change back. And so like this idea, like obviously in a, in a fee intensive market uh, or a high fee market, when you look uh, at, at something like pay join, it, it's a lot more expensive because there's the extra transaction, the extra block space. But until we get to a point where 
the block space starts getting really scarce again. I think this could be a nice little technique to really actively mislead chain analysis companies. Yeah, it's it's really creative, and this is endpoint uh, variant or uh, well, pay to endpoint is that when you communicate with the endpoint with the receiver. And if you have that receiver, sender-receiver communication, then you could agree in very interesting transactions. Now, the thing, for example, pay join. Uh, now, the thing with uh, this this swap is that it wouldn't be feasible until it gets uh, into the blockchain and gets actually some usage, right? Because otherwise you cannot hide the, hide the contract. I would say you don't really even need a contract there. You could just uh, create two transactions. Uh, you could even create two transactions with the receiver that you just send the money and the money comes back. And so send the one input, one output transaction and from that exact same transaction, uh, you another transaction when it's coming back to you. So it's not as strong as a contract, but you broadcast the transaction to the mempool uh, the same time. Then the the coming back transaction is is not as unlikely to to going to be be replaced with anything especially if it has a higher fee uh i i think there is it's it's nearly nearly yeah. impossible they would have to to make a deal with the miner to make sure no because they cannot i mean cannot dude, it's, undo. even even regardless like dude it's you could do this with people you trust like point blank you know what i mean and and there's no risk there you you trust them yeah, and, and, and that's the thing about pay to teams is that you are usually t trusting with the people you are transacting with, or at least you have a way to come back to if there is something happens. It's like pay join is, is very similar, but you, you add more trust there than a normal transaction because as a receiver, you actually expose one of your UTXO to the sender. Which is uh, which is there is this trust. So, so, so yeah. Th there are a lot of interesting things uh, one could play around with if if the if the fucking communication would be happening between the sender and the receiver, and not the medium wouldn't be the blockchain, but actually a private communication channel. Mm -hmm. And you know, I think that's gonna just be the norm. You know, after Lightning picks up like once lightning gets people used to that interactivity like did it just add it for the on-chain stuff too i mean i had an idea where i'm not going into it but uh, with bitcoin address with with not ruining the existing user workflow at all then you could create that connect and the big issue was there that that uh, you would have to do some mess I don't know, there was a big issue where Taproot actually solved it by exposing the public key. We, we talked about it before. Yeah, the, the Snicker um, idea. Yeah, so, so the only issue there is just a normal, uh, normal communication, normal peer-to-peer -peer communicate, peer-to-peer -peer DOS vectors and uh, for a peer-to-peer -peer network and nothing else is, is problematic there anymore. So. Yeah, we, we could do that. And if you get the communication between the 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 receiver and the sender, you don't actually have to do a Bitcoin transaction. A lightning transaction could just happen in the background without you even knowing that. So that's uh, that's quite an interesting thing there too. Mm -hmm. All right. Are you guys ready for some drama? All right, so I, I want to start this one off uh, with some clarifying caveats. Um, so Andreas Antonopoulos has just filed an affidavit and gotten involved in the batshit fucking crazy class action lawsuit against Tether and Finex 
alleging over $1 trillion of damages because they manipulated the market with my tether printer and the price would be higher if they didn't do that. Give me a trillion dollars, please. So I want to clarify, Andreas is not making an outright statement that that is a valid argument and that's what happened. Okay, he's not. He has not come out and gone, yeah, that they manipulated the market like that, a trillion dollars. He, he, that's not what's going on. But despite that, it's still, in my opinion, what in the holy fuck are you thinking? Um, he, he's essentially been hired by the prosecutors as an expert witness and in his affidavit testified to the stellar competence and ability to grasp things in the cryptocurrency space that the prosecuting legal team has demonstrated in his past interactions with them doing things like this. And just no, like full stop. No, that prosecuting team thought it was sane and reasonable to bring to court what Tether printer pumped the entire market and that's the only reason the price went up. We calculate a trillion dollars of damages. This legal team thought that was a sane, rational case to bring into a courtroom. So no, they're not competent. They don't get this space. They're out of their goddamn fucking minds. And I don't care that Andreas is not stepping out and directly going, yeah, the tether printer narrative is accurate. No, you are lending indirect legitimacy to this fucking insanity by getting involved in this way. So what in the holy fuck is this moron thinking? Like he's out of his mind. He is completely disconnected from reality. You know, we had an argument before where I was on the on the opinion that price manipulation is kind of a made up crime and you were arguing against that. Now you come around. <laughs> Well, no, it's not about price manipulation and whether that should be a crime or not. It's about this did not happen. Like you're like that narrative is delusional. Not only does all the, the public market data just casts incredible doubt on that, but we, we're actually at a point now where we have had people like the head of the circle OTC desk went on um, on the brink, um, Nick Carter's podcast, and fucking directly went on record talking like, no, what do you mean print money out of thin air? I handled and redeemed and, and issued hundreds of millions of dollars worth of tether every day. Like, what, what are you talking about printed out of thin air? Like, it, it, it's the, the, the fact that he is, is humoring that case by being hired by the prosecutors as a witness instead of going, you're out of your mind. He is giving his expert opinion. Maybe we shouldn't read more about into it. No, I, I very much think that we should. You know, you, you say you, he's just giving his expert opinion. Okay, to, to who? Under what context? For what ends? You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. Dennis Rodman is just going to talk to Kim Jong-un, but he, he is lending legitimacy to a fucking batshit crazy dictator just by doing that you know and that, that's that's a, a really extreme example but my point is just associating yourself with certain things is in a way legitimizing them and that's exactly what he's doing right now so you, you, you get my line of reasoning there i get your line of reasoning and the this this thing is so so much deeper just when you said that uh Oh yeah, Dennis is going to talk to Kim Jong Un, or you're going to give an interview to a magazine that sometimes is coming people, or you're going to give a speech on a conference which uh, charges a lot of money from their participants, right? And I'm I'm not sure I'm I'm in a position of <laughs> of deciding on this. It's it's quite a deep conversation there. It's this simple, okay? Like, Finax is not a fucking white dress fucking virgin bride. 
But like, dude, they're not just printing money out of thin air. And that's the whole reason the price went up. Like this shit is crazy. It's clear as day. Finex operates just enough outside of, of the reach of a few big governments like the US that they don't like that. And they have been trying nonstop every way they can to fuck with them legally, financially, through regulations. And this is just the latest fucking attempt at this. And Andreas is legitimizing that. He is humoring that as a legitimate thing rather than the completely obvious attempt it is of a government to fuck with a business in this space because they don't want this space to get big. I personally don't think I would ever want to get involved in any kind of legal proceeding uh, other than only if I have to. Even if someone would rob my house, I would rather just just mitigate the risk by myself. <laughs> I would just pack my stuff together and 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 wouldn't wouldn't go to court. Wouldn't try to f- figure out who did that. But uh, I mean. He's just giving his legal opinion on a case that's probably significant. Well, maybe, maybe his legal opinion will be not what the prosecutors would like to hear. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's just like it's just fuck him, dude. He he is adding legitimacy to bullshit. Um, plain and simple. Sorry, te- technical opinion, not legal. Sorry. Yeah, that's just what he's doing. But regardless, he's legitimizing bullshit. But you know, I don't know. Uh, let's let's hop along into the next one because this this is going to be a fun one to go through. So the state of Hawaii is pushing a bill um, that would pretty much allow banks or financial institutions to manage, hold, and interact with cryptocurrencies. Um, and th- th- this bill is just a, a fucking mess. Like th- this needs to get just completely thrown in the garbage. Um, it's defining and classifying a difference between digital assets, digital securities, and digital currency. Obviously, the three different schemes of, of regulation and how they get handled for taxes. Um, and specifically lay out both means for an institution to interact with these assets either as a pure custodian where they're they have to hold things in a segregated account pushed away or they can hold them the exact same way they do now it's just a a fucking uh, a debt against um that that amount it's not tied to a specific claim of a specific anything so pretty much how banks work now and then it also goes even further than that in specifying in in this bill that um even things like multi-signature arrangements with customers constitutes uh control or possession for the financial institution's point of view oh and every customer would have to have a specific contract with the financial institution whose services they're using uh, for all these crypto uh, products and services that specifies the exact source code that the bank is supposed to run for that specific customer um, that defines the asset that they're holding for that customer. So like Jesus fucking Christ, this is a shit show fucking mess that one just it's a clear like, okay, we can play the same fractional reserve games and you don't actually own or have a claim to this that the banks do now if if they slip you into that kind of contract with them. And then like, holy shit, at like at every customer, you're supposed to have a contract with every customer individually negotiated with them about which version of software that they're assets held with you uh, like what defines them like each customer no this is the version of a bitcoin core you have with me so if if anything splits or didn't know that's mine you have to work that out with every individual customer like they're out of their fucking mind like this is just the, the most crazy idiotic bill i have ever seen dealing with this type of shit in the space if if this passes uh, like Jesus Christ, like it's already a fucking retarded shit show in Hawaii trying to run a crypto business. You have to double collateralize 
any cryptocurrency you hold. So you have a hundred million dollars worth of Bitcoin. Well, you have to have a hundred million dollars of cash in the bank too. The Coinbase actually pulled out of Hawaii because of this. If this bill passes, that state is going to be a backwards fucking shit show that almost nothing in this space is going to want to touch. I mean, things those aren't practical are just not going to be down. So that's not how it's going to end up that negotiate with every customer, you know? Yeah, I mean, that's fucking crazy. And then also just the like, just the idea that like a legal contract is now going to subjectively define what is or isn't Bitcoin. No. All right. And then uh, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll just buzz through this one real quick. Um, just kind of a quick update about what's going on with the Quadriga CX situation in Canada. Um, so just two things real quick. Um, the former customers are renewing a push to have, <sighs> man, I, I just, I don't even know how to feel about this anymore. Um, they're, they're really pushing to still have the, the CEO of Quadriga's body exhumed to actually verify that that's really him and that he's actually dead. And while the customers and their lawyers are pushing for that in the Canadian legal system, um, Ernst and Young, the accounting firm that's trying to, to actually reconcile the books and find what money is still there, um, just requested the court approve almost half a million dollars in expenses to them for dealing with federal law enforcement agencies in tracking this information. So, you know, like this whole situation, it, it was really weird when it first happened. A lot of lack of clarity, but like as, as the months have gone on, it, it's it's just so clear at this point that it, it was just a business ran by a degenerate gambler who burned through his customers' money and just ran it fractionally reserved and continued doing that until it imploded on itself. And right now, it's just the, the these customers still holding on to the he faked his death theory while Ernst and Young burns through whatever money actually was recovered so far. And they're probably just going to burn through the available money and then go, whoopsies, that's it. We can't find anything else. And none of these customers are even going to get anything back. Like, it, it's, <laughs> it's a fucking shit show. That's all. That's all. Welcome to the real world, Shinobi. I, know, I think I saw. I think I saw Nick Zabo say something about, because he has this uh, catchphrase about um, trusted third parties are security holes, and he said trusted something like he needs to be dug up out of his hole. <laughs> it's uh, just more black humor. Yeah, uh, it's just, yeah. I don't think anybody's getting their money back, and I think that all the entertaining of potential conspiracies at this point were... Uh, just that uh, everybody getting uh, really hyperactive with our imaginations. Okay, let's go to the next one because I'm really interested about that. Oh, okay, so boom. Um, this is this really pisses me the fuck off on a personal level. Uh, local bitcoins has apparently been just shutting down massive number of user accounts. Um, it, it, it seems to be all people in Africa the Middle East and Southeast Asia, um, like just completely shutting the accounts down. Uh, no statement has been made. They're not responding to any journalists reaching out, um, asking for an explanation. Uh, Forbes covered this around five days ago. Now the crypto specific uh, outlets all over the place are starting to cover it and they still have not made any comment or explained anything. But I'm I'm pretty sure it's going on here. It's just this is another instance of the five AML money laundering shit out of the FATF, the, the travel rules, just all of this finally squeezing businesses um into just cutting off whole sections of their customer base where they just don't even want to take the risk of of trying to comply with this stuff there. And it's how many people were like are just gonna lose their money now? 
like have no access to it. Like people actually use the the wallet on local bitcoins and the escrow functionality for that. So how many people uh, completely scattered all over the world with no cost effective, no practical way to actually legally contact local bitcoins based in Europe? Um, and just their money's gone. So like, what the fuck? Like, you know, th this was where I bought my first Bitcoins. And I did that because it was private. I could just fucking go meet somebody, hand cash, done. And like over the past year or two, this platform has been completely imploding on itself. Like it, it's, it doesn't even resemble the, the platform I used when I got my first Bitcoins. And it, it's kind of fucking sad. But, you know, like, like... <laughs> You, you know what I mean? Like how many people all over the world in places that, that don't have the best economies, you know, people on average don't have as much money as they, they do in places like Western Europe or America. And all of them are just cut off from any Bitcoin they had on that, that platform. Now, all, all the traders who made their living on that platform are just completely cut off from the reputational history they built up on that platform. Like, Fuck local bitcoins. Like they they are fucking they're fucking scumbags. Like if, if you're gonna have to do something like this because of regulatory pressure, announce it, let them get their money off your platform, and then do it. This is fucking indefensibly scummy as fuck. With that said, I think there is a simpler explanation. They shut down local bitcoins in places where their volume was low and their support requests were high, meaning that in high trust societies, the Western societies, you can go and sell your stuff uh, and without being afraid of and rob you, uh, except London. But, uh, but in Southeast Asia and Africa, it's not the case there. So they might have more work to do on those places yet they had less volumes but like dude that doesn't make sense because if you're going to do that then you make an announcement like we're winding it down let people pull their money off like this is they just closed these accounts like you can't log in you can't add like just closed out of nowhere no explanation mm -hmm. yeah okay. there's there's not really a good defense for that. Like any changes where people are losing access to their money, you you at least deserve to give them an answer for that. Mm -hmm. How about exit scamming? I did, I did. How would they get away with that? I mean, they're they're a, a, where are they based out of again? Geneva, the Netherlands, Finland, no? Finland? It's yeah, now Finland now. Yeah, yeah. That that's a major like developed European country. You can't just exit scam as a registered company like that. Like they're they'd get fucked. I'm not sure. I mean, do you know their faces? Because I don't. I, I they, no, they are so not part you, of the conversation. I guarantee you, the government of Finland does. Yeah, I'm not sure. Well, it's like you, early 2013 software. Go ahead, Jenny. You could argue that even if they did try to exit scam, maybe maybe they're not like. Maybe the Finnish government wouldn't do anything because if they're trying to crack down on Bitcoin being used, this is generating negative press. And I don't know, maybe they weighed the, weighed the consequences and they thought that it would be better to just let them do this. I have no idea. Maybe they will do something. They could be exit scamming and maybe they're not in Finland anymore. And maybe the Finnish government will do something. But I... The, so far from what I've seen out of Finland outside of, I think there was like an economics paper or something that was saying good things about Bitcoin, but I haven't seen any good things specifically from Finland in terms of their outlook on Bitcoin. Well, whatever the ultimate cause is, like they're, they're fucking scummy as fuck. I mean, it's, I can't even believe this, like <laughs> seriously. I know, dude. It's they are like, not taking away the money. I mean, th there must be some. That cannot be the full story. Well, so far, it's what it seems to be. And, you know, like I said, they've actively been ignoring all the, the media outlets' requests for comment. And this is, I think, six days now since the original Forbes article was put out. All right. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I guess. Uh, 
that is last story up next. It's you, Janine. Yeah, so in the last two days, I've seen some really interesting articles about a new bill that has, as far as I know, it hasn't actually been proposed yet, but it was obtained um, in some draft form by Bloomberg. Um, The bill is supported by mainly Republican Senator Lindsey Graham, and then uh, it's kind of confusing to what degree he's involved, but reportedly also Democratic Senator Richard Blumenthal. And there's a good summary of the bill and you know, what it says and the implications from the Center for Democracy and Technology. So I'll I'll read that because they did a good job of uh, basically tying together all of this legal language. So um, they write, the bill would put the attorney general at the head of a commission that develops, quote, best practices for preventing online child exploitation exploitation and would amend section 230 to require online services to certify that they follow these best practices um, or they will risk significant liability if individuals use their services to post or send child sexual abuse material which they abbreviate to c uh, csam Um, for quick reference section 230 refers to the communications decency act cda of 1996 which, uh, quote, provides immunity from liability for providers and users of an interactive computer service who publish information provided by third-party users. Um, And it states that, quote, no provider or user of an interactive computer service shall be treated as the publisher or speaker of any information provided by another information content provider. Um, The uh, Center for Democracy article Um, They say that the attorney general would be able to unilaterally modify the commission's best practices and could launch investigations against online services if he has reason to believe they have made a false certification. The attorney general would be able to use civil investigative demands to compel documents and testimony from service providers who face up to two years in prison under a new criminal provision if they are found to have knowledge um, submitted Wait, if they are found to have knowingly submitted a certification that contains a false statement. The bill would also lower the knowledge standard in child exploitation laws, which currently requires entities to have actual knowledge that they are distributing CSAM. Under the new lower standard, eh, intermediaries who attorney general's best practices would face lawsuits for acting recklessly. Um, So now how would this um, be... Uh, be a bit of an issue for the use and proliferation. Eh, I cannot talk today. Proliferation of encryption tools. Um, they say that the attorney general would be tasked with developing, or among other things, identifying, categorizing, and reporting material related to child exploitation or child abuse. The attorney general could thus decide that it is a best practice for online services to run all content on their platform through a filter to detect CSAM, which would effectively forbid companies from implementing end-to-end encryption. Given the Attorney General's vocal disapproval of end-to-end encryption services, it seems highly likely that he would use the course of power granted to him in this bill to strong-arm companies into dropping end-to-end encryption and monitoring their users' communications. Um, so this is like a very, this is a very, there's a very dense history to this bill. And it's, it's literally only just come out. I think the Bloomberg article is, it came out like yesterday, very recently. Um, so I've included the link to the Bloomberg article. And there's also a very long and detailed analysis of the bill and its history and implications from, I think it was... I think it was Stanford Law. Yeah, Stanford Cyber Law. So check those out if you want to read more about this. But um, anything that, you know, um, I I think anything that ends up affecting end in encryption is going to have an effect on Bitcoin stuff too, because you could argue that maybe the attorney general, um, because this would be speech, and that's something that has slightly more protection than, for example, money as speech, um, actual, uh, quote, actual speech. Um, So I could imagine the attorney general having a similar power over, you know, companies that are hosting um, cryptocurrency related stuff, 
and them making an argument that they have to, you know, implement more KYC or have their users disclose what they're transacting for in order to then go to the attorney general and this commission and say, like, we, you know, we fulfilled the best practice of preventing users from even possibly using their money for, you know, child exploitation. Um, so this will be important going forward if it actually gets any uh, ground at all. Yeah, what the fuck? Remove publisher status as a default thing and you have to earn it? Yes. Like, what? <laughs> see, this is exactly why the entire time that that fucking social media censorship has been a fucking big political narrative my attitude has been i don't care go fuck yourself if you want to try and get the government involved because that literally is the government just gets to pick and choose who's allowed to have platforms like that because the minute you remove remove that fucking publisher protection they're fucked they will get litigated into bankruptcy this is exactly yep. the kind of fucking shit that I knew was going to happen if people kept pushing the direction, get the government involved. Yeah, and a lot of the articles about, you know, how is this going to affect Facebook? Because, you know, Facebook is a big company and supposedly, um, I mean, I don't, I don't really believe it, but they are of the opinion that Facebook has done a lot more recently to privacy. Uh, so they think like, oh, what's Facebook going to do now? But like Facebook has a lot of money and influence, so they're going to be able to squeeze their ass out of any trouble. This is going to affect smaller providers. Um, so yeah, this is who like who not only don't have the influence, but they don't have the money to, you know, hire some lawyer or whatever, whoever responsible for doing this to go through the certification process and oh like seriously every every law that comes out like this every bill that comes out like this i bet it just makes all of the compliance people like so excited because it's like oh more mm -hmm. jobs job more jobs for us it's like yeah. yeah more paper pushers yeah i mean that's that's the only way something like this goes the big companies that can actually push back push back and eventually them and the government wind up on a common page and then nobody else can fucking build a, a company or service like that because they're not they're not part of the club and now the government is directly in charge of, of directing how these platforms are managed and i mean i don't because i mean this this obviously applies to u.s based companies it's going to be even worse for ones that are not based in the u.s because I don't, I don't, I haven't checked. I'm not certain whether they even have the same kind of protection or classification as U.S. services. But this is like basically anything not in the U.S. is going to be treated even more harshly at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is yeah. This is why you don't run to the fucking government every time you have a problem because they come in and they make 10 more problems this is also another reason to not rely on centralized services for your tools although that sucks because a lot of people do and they don't have the skills and experience necessary to to run their stuff on their own in a way that's reliable and censorship resistant but yeah good reason to expand that area of decentralized tech well, I'm betting that this is going to be a uh, topic that comes up on the show uh, for a while to come. I guess, no par, you got any uh, any thoughts on this? Not really. I mean, it's, as Johnny said, it's just a draft, right? Well, well, it's not clear what stage. I mean, yes, it's a draft because the bill hasn't actually been proposed. And usually, I think bills can be proposed in a draft stage. So yeah, it's technically a draft, but we are not sure when it's going to be proposed because according to Bloomberg, it hasn't been and they just got a copy of it somehow. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe it will never even get through the initial review phase. We'll Let's see. see. Graham is a crazy cracker. All right. Well, I guess take it into final thoughts. Yes, I would like to th thanks for our sponsor Skillshare to enabling us to to talk about 
and and do the <laughs> digest. <laughs> All right, Janine, you got anything? Um, I would like to thank our sponsor, NordVPN. <laughs> All right. I am so sad because none of no one wasn't in the showroom is going to get that joke. We'll we'll get it. I'll get it done. And believe me, there will be millions of things we can make joke commercials about. All right. I guess on that note, uh, catch you later, punks. Uh, safeguard Bitcoin. I'm going skiing and ignoring all of you chuckle fucks all weekend. Adios. Oh my god. Bye bye. To the moon. Hello, <laughs> <laughs>